Raise your hand if you've ever been on a fishing trip before. If you've ever been fishing. Quite, quite a few of us. Fishing seems to be one of Americans' favorite pastimes. Actually, there is a 2013 outdoor recreation report that ranked fishing as the number three activity, the third activity of, uh, Amer- that Americans prefer to do outdoors. It ranked number three on that list. Just behind walking and biking, fishing was the third most talked about outdoor activity. I remember my first fishing trip. I was about seven years old. My grandfather was the one that that took me fishing. I remember being really excited about this. You know, as a kid, you hear the stories of fishing. You read stories about a fishing experience, and it just seems like it's going to be amazing. So I was really excited about this, my seven-year-old self, and it was my older brother who was with me. We spent the night at my grandparents' house and excited about the next morning. We pack a cooler of lunch and snacks, and we stay up pretty late getting ready for this trip. Morning comes. I wake up. It's early. I'm tired. But it's fishing, so I'm going to push through that. So we get in the car. We go to the boat. It's cold, but it's fishing, so I'm going to push through that. I, I cast my, my line, and nothing's happening. This is incredibly boring, <laughs> but it's fishing, so I'm going to push through that. I take a nap inside the, the fishing boat. I wake up. I'm hungry, but it's fishing, so push through that. My grandfather, he encourages me to try again. So I cast my line and finally something bites. I reel in the fish. It's flopping all kinds of different directions. My grandfather has the nerve to ask me to take the fish off the hook. (laughs) This is disgusting. I don't want to touch that thing. But it's fishing. I got to be honest, I I must have complained a lot on that trip because my grandfather never took me fishing again. (laughs) And some of you know my my grandfather is the sweetest man (laughs) ever, but he never took me fishing again. I, I find it interesting because when we think about fishing, we think about a relaxing activity where there's not a care in the world, you're out on the water. We even have the phrase, gone fishing, that suggests that someone is away on vacation. When looking at the top reasons people fish, I found it very interesting because actually catching fish was not one of those reasons. (laughs) There was this CBS article that actually Uh, said it like this, some men fish their entire lives without realizing it's not the fish they're after. Some people are fishing their entire lives, but they don't even want fish. I think our perspective on fishing has changed from a time when it was a requirement for survival to just being a passive activity, a time where it was a necessity to being optional. But let's look to the word. This is Matthew 4, 19. I encourage you to pick up a Bible, dig into the scripture with me. If you have a Bible in the pew in front of you and you do not have a personal Bible of your own, please feel free to take that Bible as our gift to you. But read this with me. This is Matthew 4, 19. It reads like this. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Simple scripture. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. The title of this morning's concluding message of our series is Gone Fishing. As Christians, I believe we need to readjust our perspective on fishing. 
When we say yes to following Jesus, when we agree to go fishing for Christ, it's not an option. It's a mandate because it's not about recreation, but reclamation. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sweet time of worship and the testimonials of your goodness that went forth this morning. But now, God, in this moment, I I ask that you release me of myself, that you empty me of everything that is me and fill me with your spirit, God, so that the words that come out of my mouth are not my words, but they are your words from your spirit to your people so that everybody under the sound of my voice hears a customized message, that they hear what they need to hear so we all can leave this place feeling equipped, empowered, and ready to do your work and to do it your way. And for that, God will give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sport fishing, or recreational fishing as it's called, has become a multi-billion, with a B, dollar global industry. Multi-billion dollar global industry. Tens of thousands of people are following fishing. In fact, there's a petition uh, for fishing fishing to be uh, an Olympic event in 2020. That's how serious the world is about fishing. I think it's interesting, though, the history of fishing, how it started off as a means to survive and now has become a commercialized industry. The challenge is, since fishing is still prevalent in our culture today, we can have a tendency, even unconsciously, we can have a tendency to overlay our perception, our reality, our vision of fishing on top of the Scripture. Even on a subconscious level, we can, we can do that because fishing is going to generate images for us today that may be different than the images that were in the Word. See, I think if we want to be serious about this family adventure, if we want to be serious about fishing, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of the original hearers of the text. You see, Andrew and Simon Peter would have heard that scripture we just read maybe a little differently than we heard it today. So walk with me for a little bit. Let's put ourselves back in the shoes of Andrew or Simon Peter and maybe hear that scripture as they would have heard it. First, I think it's important to note that when Jesus calls Andrew and Simon Peter, this was not their first encounter with Jesus. We know Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, and we know that Andrew was walking with John the Baptist one day when Jesus walked by, and John the Baptist points out and says, that is Jesus, the Messiah. And Andrew immediately starts following Jesus. We see this in John 1, 35 through 42. I'll read it for you, and some of it will be on the screen. It says, the next day John was there again with his two disciples, When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist speaking. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who had heard what John had said and, had, and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. See, this is significant. This is significant to understand the order of these events, because Jesus always calls you to know him before he calls you to follow him. He calls you to a relationship with him before he ever sends you on assignment. 
See, when you read that scripture, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, out of context, you can forget the priority of our faith is a relationship. The priority of our faith is being able to see God, believe God, follow God, and then we work for God. And I'm not saying that we don't have work to do. I'm saying that our role should never supersede our relationship. Our role, our assignment should never supersede our relationship. That's why even throughout this series, I said I have two goals for everybody that's been here. Two goals. One of them is if you do not know Jesus, if you have not declared Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, my hope is that you do so. Is that you claim God as the only true living God. Then you can consider how God is going to use you. See, this is important to me because I feel there are far too many churches that are so busy trying to get people in the seats on that ministry team, this ministry team, that they forget, we forget, to ask the simple question, do you know Jesus? Can you recognize his voice? Do you know where he's staying? Are you in his presence? See, we're so busy trying to get people to do this or that where we, 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 we bypass this simple fact that before you can release people, you got to make sure they know who the living God is. Andrew and Simon would have heard Jesus calling them after they had a relationship with Jesus, after they already believed in Jesus, after they are already following Jesus. Jesus, they would have heard Jesus calling them to go be fishers of people. Not before, after. We got to understand that. That's their context. That's the context they, they would have heard it in. They would have understood relationship comes before the role. But they also would have heard this scripture in a very different cultural context than we have today. So this scene where Jesus calls them and tells them that he's going to make them fishers of people or fishers of men, they would have been at the Sea of Galilee fishing. By this time in history, fishing would have been very prevalent in the Galilee economy. In fact, there would not have been a separation between fishing and normal everyday activity. They were one. It wasn't people fishing over there, people working over here. Fishing was a part of the day-to-day -day activity. So when Jesus calls them to follow him, when he says, come follow me and I will teach you how to fish, but fish for people, what they would have heard him saying is, I'm going to teach you how to do what you're doing for fish, but instead of catching fish, you're going to catch people. Now I'm going to take you and do something different. Every single thing that you're doing, the same work ethic that you have catching fish, the same amount of time that you're putting catching fish, I'm going to teach you how to do that, take that, but get people instead. They wouldn't have heard it, oh, okay, we're going to go fishing now with Jesus. It would have been, no, if you're asking me to, I'm going to teach you now how to fish for people, the verb, the action of fishing wouldn't have changed. The noun changed. You're now not fishing for fish. You're going to fish for people. But they would have heard it as, wow, this is some work that's going to have to be done. They would have heard that in their context. They also would have understood in the New Testament, fishing did not happen on a clear, sunny day. That's not what it would have looked like. Even when we read that scripture, because of our own mind, and this isn't bad, it's just the reality and we got to know the truth. In our own mind, we might even read that scripture and picture a sunny day and Jesus talking to them. But that's probably not what it looked like. Because fishing in the New Testament times often happened at night. It was in the nighttime where the largest catch of fish would have been gotten. For a few reasons. One, because of the heat of the day, but also because of the equipment that was being used, it was more efficient to catch fish in the darkness. So they would have heard 
When Jesus says, I'm going to teach you how to fish for people, they would have heard and understood what that meant was, you are going to have to fish in darkness. You are going to have to fish in darkness. We are called to proclaim the redemptive promises of God that we have through the blood of Jesus. As believers, we are free, but we have a responsibility if we're going to follow Jesus to fish in the darkness. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, we have the opportunity. We had the opportunity to walk out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. But now that we're in the kingdom of God, we have a responsibility to make sure we're fishing back in darkness. You know, when I'm thinking about this, I'm reminded of of Harriet Tubman. And you all are probably all familiar with Harriet Tubman, but Harriet Tubman was born into bondage and she became free in 1849. And she became a very influential abolitionist uh, and amongst many other things that she did. Harriet Tubman, now being free, she could have enjoyed her freedom. She could have stayed free and still did tremendous things trying to change the circumstances and the situation and the laws and the politics as a free person. That would have been her right to do. But she understood that her freedom was not only about her, it was about making sure that other people that were still in bondage were able to experience the freedom she was experiencing. She understood that it just wasn't about her. Now that she was free, she had a responsibility to make sure that other people that were in bondage were able to walk in the light as well. So history tells us that she went back to the South at least 19 times. History gets this stuff wrong, so I think it's more than that. But at least 19 times and was able to free over 300 people that were in bondage. And this is very interesting because it wasn't just freeing people to the North because in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which meant if somebody that was enslaved got freedom, the uh, owner could come get that enslaved person and bring them back to bondage. So Harriet Tubman would not only just get those that were in bondage to the north, she had to get them all the way across the Canadian border. I'm sure it was dangerous. I'm sure she was scared. I'm sure that it was dark. But she understood that as a free person now, there's a responsibility she had to make sure that those that were still in bondage were gathered and brought to freedom. We have that same responsibility as believers. We have that same responsibility. We can't just be free and then we can do incredible things as our freedom. But when Jesus told them that he's going to make them fish for people, they would have understood what that meant was they need to fish back in darkness and bring people to freedom. See, I think one of the challenges is as Christians— we have a tendency to think that people in the kingdom of darkness are in darkness by their own choices. The people in bondage did not choose to be in bondage. The people that were enslaved did not choose to be enslaved. It's the same way for our faith. We can't look at people, oh, they're in darkness, so I'm just going to wait until they... No! We have a responsibility as stewards of God's grace to make sure that people that are in the kingdom of darkness still, not by their own free will, based on the fact that this this earth is still governed by the dominion of darkness, we have a responsibility to make sure that they come to the light. Simon Peter and Andrew would have understood that fishing meant that we're fishing in darkness. They would have understood something else as well. They would have understood that in darkness, they are not to take on the essence of darkness, but instead, as it says in Ephesians 5, 8, for you are formerly darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
I don't want anybody to confuse my words and think that I'm giving you permission to go out there and sin when I say we got to go back into the dark kingdom. What I'm saying is that we are to take our light that we have because we have the light of life and we're supposed to glow in the dark for Jesus. We take our light to darkness. We walk as children of light and we glow in the dark for Jesus. That's the reality that Simon, Peter, and Andrew would have heard. They also would have understood that they have to cast a net. It's easy to read this verse and have your own mental image of fishing because we're, people fish. So it's easy to read this verse and say, okay, line, hook, but that wouldn't have been the way they heard it. They would have heard it from the understanding that it means we have to cast a net. In particularly, the net that was probably used during that passage of Scripture was a net called a carrier net that was between 15 to 25 feet in diameter, and it was surrounded by what was called sinkers or rocks or weights to weigh the net down. So they were to stand on the shoreline, and they would cast that net, and then they would gather the fish. They would roll up their sleeves, roll up their pants, go in the water, and wrestle the fish back to shore. That's a completely different image than casting a line and reeling in a fish. But it's the image that they would have heard it from. We have a responsibility to cast a net and wrestle the fish to the shore. I I like how author Don Marquis says it. He says, when talking about fishing, our idea of fishing is to leave all the extortion up to the fish. If they are ambitious, we will catch them. If they are not, we let them go about their business. Isn't that true? Like when you're fishing, if a fish isn't hungry enough, uh, we'll, we'll go over here. If a fish is hungry, they'll bite, right? But I feel this has gotten to the posture of the church. We've gotten into this mentality of, well, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to, if this person really feels like they need it, or if this person's really down and out, or if there is um, an opportunity, if they're showing interest, then I'm going to go and try to reel them in. That's not the image of fishing. It's casting a net. it's It's not if we build it, they will come. They would have understood that you go to where the fish are, and you cast a net, and you bring in those fish. You work to bring in those fish. It's not a passive job, it's strenuous labor. Even when you are not catching the fish, you are preparing to sell the fish, you are cleaning the fish, you are cleaning your nets, you are repairing your nets. This was an all-day assignment. That's how they would have heard it. Not a passive job. They would have understood that fishing meant casting a net, not casting a line. See, this is why I'm so thankful for for Pastor Kim and the initiatives that she's starting here with the juvenile hall outreach that you've heard about earlier, with the nursing home outreach that we're doing. Pastor Kim has already connected with Limebach Elementary School. We're in talks with Valley High School, CRC, so we can forge some partnerships and cast a net in this community. This the Valley High community is our pond. Our responsibility is to cast a net on this community, roll up our sleeves, get in the water, and wrestle the fish back to shore. It's not just sitting here, hope somebody comes, let me get some fresh bait. That's not, that's, that's not what it's about. That's not the way they would have heard it as the early disciples and apostles of God. We will not be a church that sits on the sidelines. We will be a church that is intentional about our father's business. Y'all didn't get too excited about that. So I'll say we are going to be a church that is intentional about our father's business. Because Jesus does not call us to vacation. He calls us to vocation. That's what this fishing is. It's not vacation. You're not on vacation with Jesus. God is cool, there's joy, there's peace, that's awesome, but he did not call you to vacation, he called you to vocation. We have work to do. 
I, I like how comedian Steve Wright said it. He said, there's a, a, a fine line between fishing and standing on the shore like an idiot. <laughs> I like, that's true. I, lo- I started cracking up when I read that. There is. It's like there's a fine line between actually fishing and just standing on the shoreline like an idiot. Andrew and Simon Peter would have envisioned when they heard and answered Jesus that it meant casting a net, not a hook and line, because that is not the context that they would have heard the scripture through. Andrew and Simon Peter would have understood that they were to fish in darkness, that they were to cast a net, but they also would have understood something very important that I want us to hear today. And it's it's that fishing is not an individual task, but a corporate assignment. They would have understood that. Now, sure, it was, it's a personal relationship. Yes, when Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people, uh, they didn't, I, I, it, the scripture doesn't tell us that they sat and debated and took a vote. Uh, they each could have said yes or no. But once they said yes, they would have understood that they were in this thing together. They would have understood that because the context of fishing in their age. Yes, you can cast a, a, um, a carrier net one person, but it's far more efficient when you're casting it with multiple people. You got one person on this side, one person on this side, they're casting it together, they're gathering the net together, and they're wrestling together. They would have, that, that's why they were together when they were fishing when Jesus called them, because it's more efficient. It is possible to use a, a carrier net and catch fish, but it's far more efficient when you're doing it together. Now, we understand that fishing is a relationship builder, even in today's time. In fact, 87% of Americans believe fishing and boating have a positive effect on family relationships. There's a survey, Recreational and Boating and Fishing Foundation. They said uh, Americans believe fishing and boating are one of the best ways to spend quality time with their friends and family. So, There's an understanding, even in today's culture, that fishing is good for relationship. But they would have, Simon Peter and Andrew would have understood it on a deeper level. It would have been more than just a team building activity. (laughs) They, They would have understood that it was vital for them to work side by side. It was critical because the fish were too valuable to lose. So they would have understood that if I got my side of the net and you are are slacking off texting somebody, whatever they used to do back then, on your side of the net, and the fish fly out, that's, no, you can't, this is my livelihood. There's souls on the line. It's too valuable to the kingdom of God when, when everybody is not holding their piece of the net. It's too valuable. They would have understood that. They would have, okay, I get this. We are in this together because in my context, that's what fishing was about. Every fish was valuable. Every single one. In the same way, our assignment is a collective one. I don't care if you've been going to this church for 30 years. I don't care if you've made a decision to follow Christ in the last 30 minutes. You have an assignment if you are a follower of God and our livelihood, our effectiveness as believers is dependent on whether you're holding your side of the net or not. If you're not holding your side of the net, there's a fish, there's a soul that might get away. I like how it says in Ephesians 4, 9 through 12, it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be in power, overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You, me, the Holy Spirit, together, 
the Holy Spirit working collectively in all of us, we become an unmovable force in which the gates of hell will not prevail. Not just me, not just you, you, me, all of us, with the Holy Spirit, we create an unmovable force in which the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, I'm going to conclude with, with this, and then I, I want to I give you something. There's a, an old um, Peanuts cartoon, and Lucy, Linus was watching TV, and Lucy comes in and demands that Linus change the channel. Linus says, well, how, how can you come in like demand things? Lucy says, these five fingers. She said, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Individually, they are nothing. But when they unify... There is a weapon that you do not want to mess with. <laughs> Linus, he sighs and he turns away. He says, all right, it's yours. As he's walking, he looks at his hand and he says, how come you guys can't get organized like that? <laughs> <laughs> Together, individually, we're special. I need every single one of my fingers but together, there's an unmovable force. There's a weapon that we have with the Holy 